Welcome back to those of you who've been able to join us um, for some of our previous sessions. If it's your first time here, welcome. Hopefully, inshallah, the diagram behind me does not scare you away, inshallah. This, hopefully, this will be a very meaningful diagram by the end of the session. We do hope to explore its meaning, inshallah. So the, discuss, the topic for today is, um, in Arabic, what's called the nafs. In English, we might sometimes translate this as the ego. And we're talking in this series about spiritual impediments, things which obstruct our journey as we attempt to grow spiritually, as we attempt to grow near to Allah Ta'ala. Spiritual impediments are those things that come and obstruct our path. And today's is really important. Today's topic, um, the nafs. We sometimes translate it as the ego. And there's a little bit of an issue with that translation. In terms of the nafs, why is this such an important topic? Because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He at times connects disciplining our nafs, controlling our nafs, to entering paradise. So Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al Nazi'at, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ as for the one who fears standing before Allah and prohibits their nafs and restrains their nafs from following its desires, فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ Then the final abode of that for that person is paradise. Notice the connection there. If we're able to discipline and control our nafs, then paradise is our home. So it becomes a matter of success here. Allah says in Surah Al-Shams, after taking many oaths, I believe about 11 oaths, 11 qasams, oaths, Allah then finally says, indeed successful is the one who has purified their nafs. Like success. The ultimate success for the believer, falah, is paradise. So what does it take to get to paradise? Disciplining and purifying your nafs. And then Allah goes on to say, and the one who fails to do so is in utter loss. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَ So it's really a matter of the nafs. Um, one person put it this way. They said the journey to paradise is two steps. The first step is on your nafs, and the second step is through the doors. The first step is on your nafs. To discipline the nafs. The word discipline is a scary word. It sounds very harsh and like... But the word discipline really comes from the root, the Latin root, which means to teach. That's where we get the word disciple. A disciple is like a student. It's someone you teach. Discipline is in essence teaching. Teaching yourself. But we often think of teaching as one person standing up or sitting and just, you know giving a lecture and everyone else listens and goes home. But true teaching is to, to not only share words and guidance, but to walk the individual along the path, right? It's, it's to actually take a person through an experience of understanding something. And so when we say disciplining our nafs, we're not, we're not here to talk about some type of really harsh regimen of self-discipline or something. That's not really what we're here to talk about. But we're here to talk about, well, the matter of the nafs is something that for a lot of us, if we're completely honest, it's an afterthought. The nafs is like an afterthought. We go through life, going through life. And then maybe along the way, sometimes we remember, oh, there's this thing called a nafs. And that's not a really... Uh, smart approach, inshallah. We'll, we'll, I'll explain why. So let's start by defining terms. We often in our culture talk about self-discipline, correct? What is the self that we're talking about disciplining? Self-discipline, disciplining the self. What's the self? This sounds like a philosophy 101 class, right? What is the self? Yeah, no, but that's a real question for us. What are we trying to discipline here? Because if we don't even know what we're talking about, then how are we about to going to go and start disciplining this thing? 
And so we don't really have a clear answer, I think. A lot of people will say it's the subjective uh, sense of my own being, you know, like I, it's the I. The word ego in Latin just means I, right? It just means I. So it's my, who, it's my subjective s sense of being. But, that's, but even that, what are we talking about? Your feelings, your thoughts, a collect collection of all of them? And what does it even mean to discipline all of that? And so the Islamic concept is actually quite, it's quite elaborate, as you can see behind me. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that, inshallah. One thing about the word ego, when we translate the nafs as ego, there's a problem there. Because in English, there's, the word ego carries an inherently negative connotation. Like, you never use the word ego in a positive sense, right? Like, oh, that dude's got a lot of ego. Like, it's a good thing. We never, we never use it that way. Ego is always a bad thing in English. The, word, the nafs is not like that. The nafs is not some inherently bad thing. There is, when it's disciplined, then the nafs is a good thing. The nafs is not our, it's not inherently evil. But yes, when left to its own devices, the nafs can definitely uh, cause a lot of harm to an individual. Okay. One of the interesting things about the Qur'an and even in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, is that we don't find much detail about what the nafs is. So the, the word nafs is used in the Qur'an over and over again. Nafs, nafs, nafs. But like, what constitutes the nafs? What's the anatomy of the nafs. We don't really have a, any explanation from the Prophet وسلم, or in the Quran about that. And so how do we make, make sense of it? Even the word qalb, the heart. One thing to clarify, the scholars clarify that when we say heart, we're not talking about this piece of flesh in our, in our chest. Imam al-Ghazali is very explicit about this. Because if we talk about diseases of the heart, I remember when I used to hear about that, I'd be like, Sounds a little questionable because like, what are you talking about? Clogged arteries? Like, what are we talking about? Diseases of the heart, jealousy. How do I know there's jealousy in my heart? And what, what does it mean for it to be in my heart? Can you do heart surgery and like locate jealousy, remove it? You know what I mean? Because we never used to talk about these things. There would just be this general idea of diseases of the heart. Imam al-Ghazali, he explains that no, we're not talking about this piece of flesh. He says, we're talking about a metaphysically different heart that does have a connection to this heart. That does have a connection to this heart. The nature of that connection is not clear to us. And, and the reason why we talk about that connection is because why else call it a heart? If it's not this thing right here, if it's metaphysically different, why call it a heart? Why not call it like a spiritual kidney or spiritual lung? Well, it's because it's connected to this heart in some way. It has a ta'alluq, a relation to this. Okay, so the Qur'an uses words like qalb, which is like heart we translate. It uses words like nafs, which we sometimes translate as the lower self. Maybe some would translate it as the ego. The ruh, we talk about ruh, which is sometimes translated as a spirit. But all these things seem so similar. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we talking about? These things are metaphysically different than the human body. And that's the really, I think, uh, interesting thing for us Muslims is when we think about human beings, we think about humans in a very different way than people who don't believe in the unseen, people who don't believe in revelation. In case you might be wondering, okay, Sheikh, like, if you can't see it, how do you know it exists? I know my kidney exists because, like, literally we could dissect and see the kidney. But you talking about this metaphysically different heart and spirit and nafs, how do we know? We know it because of revelation. We know it because Allah, the creator of human beings, has told us of the nafs, has told us of our spirit, our ruh, 
has told us about our heart. And then when we live our lives, we see. We see manifestations and we see the effects of possessing these things. There's something different about a human being. You ever thought about that? Like, there's something different about talking when, when you talk to a human being. And we would, you could call it life or consciousness. But like, what are we talking about? Because now you have, you have popular culture, which will explore in movies and stuff, a human being's relationship to a machine. If you have a machine that totally gets you, that memorizes everything that you like, sometimes people forget your name. Right? Imagine a machine doesn't forget your name. You tell it one time you like strawberry cheesecake, it will remember that. Anything you tell the machine, it'll learn it. It'll learn more about it. This machine learns how to be empathic, learns all these, you know, therapeutic modalities, can be your therapist. And yet what? At some level, when you speak to that machine, there's something missing. Right, so the, you'll see uh, in popular culture, they'll show this, where a person will be talking and, and they'll almost, almost fall in love with their machine, like a computer at home. And then one day the machine tells them, look, I, I know what you're going through. I, I, I feel your pain. And the human goes, no, you don't. Like you electronically can intellectualize, not even intellectualize, because we're not even talking about intellect here, but we're, you can, you know, logically conclude what you think I'm experiencing. You don't feel my pain. Do you understand that? Like, you don't have mirror neurons to truly understand my pain. There's something unique about the human being. And so we know that. We know that from experience. No matter, that's why even if you were to take a like a doll, it's not the same. There's just something different about a human. The human spirit, we talk about it. It's in our language. And so we know about this. And so from Revelation, we know about it and we see it in our daily lives. But the question still remains, what's the nature of it? And that's where scholars, this is, this is something to learn, something to think about. How did scholars in the past interact with concepts that they found in Revelation, which Revelation itself did not explicate, did not, you know, expound upon and, 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 and give details about? So there were obviously going to be some Muslims who would read the word qalb, heart, and say, well, that's what, it means whatever it means. We don't really know. It means the heart, and that's it. What's the nature of the heart? We won't delve into it. We don't know. Allah didn't tell us. There were others who came along and said, wait, there are other civilizations that have concepts of heart, of the heart, that actually when we consider those concepts, they actually align with our teachings in Islam. And so they would kind of import these understandings and say that perhaps this is what is meant by the heart. They're not saying this is exactly what Allah meant because Allah didn't say that. But they would say this is one way to start conceptualizing the heart. What you see on the screen behind you is one such example. This is taken from, this is a modern researcher today, Dr. Abdullah Rothman uh, in, in Cambridge, uh, England, at uh, Cambridge Muslim College there with Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. So Dr. Abdullah Rothman, this is his drawing, um, obviously based on earlier sources from scholars of the past. But this concept has its roots in Plato. This is a Platonian idea at its core. Muslims were not averse to this idea of drawing from the works of the Greeks, provided it does not contradict what our religion teaches. And so there had to be a filtering process. And it wasn't like, it wasn't, you know, superficial. Today you get people like, yo, manifestation, yo, that's like dua. It's like, no, it's not. There's a difference, okay? 
That's like a that's like a cheap application of let's take this concept and slap on some spirituality, make it Islamic. That's not what they did. They were very critical. Imam Al Ghazali was very critical of philosophers, very critical. And he wrote a whole book refuting the incoherences of the philosophers, the tahafutul falasifa. Yet he still took from their ideas, where he saw alignment with the Islamic worldview. This is one example. So when we think about the human body, the human body is one body, but it also is composite. So we have parts to the body, despite the fact that the body is one body. And so you could speak about the body as a whole, but you could also speak about the body in terms of its parts. Do you understand that? Depending on how you're referring to the body. So if you say, um, my body hurts, it doesn't necessarily mean everything hurts, it means a part of it, acknowledging that your body has parts. But you could say that I have one body, one human body, depending on how, it's composite from one aspect, but it's also one unit from a different aspect. The same could be said about the, the, the nefs and the heart. When we speak about the heart, we could talk about everything, including the nafs and the ruh, everything. Or we could talk about this one aspect of it or the parts of it. It's composite from one perspective. And so you have, you have a ruh, and if you guys can just follow the cursor here. You have a ruh right here at the top. And we put it at the top because it's in essence oriented towards the divine, the ruh that the human being has, the spirit, ruh, spirit, this is something from Allah. This is something from Allah. Allah, when he spoke about the prophet Adam in the Quran, he says, fihi min ruhi. The translation of this is a challenging translation because we don't know the, the, the true understanding of this. Allah says, and I blew into him from my spirit. Allahu a'lam bi muradihi bidalik. Allah best knows what that means. But what we understand is that the spirit comes from God directly. And human beings in the womb, in the womb also, Allah infuses the human being with a spirit, with a ruh. And once the ruh is infused, this is where you get discussions, and I'm not going to go into that discussion, but this is where you get discussions about until when or under what circumstances would abortion be allowed. Prior to the ruh being uh, you know, blown into the, the fetus, it's not considered a full human being. It's not considered a full human, because for us, a human being is not just a body, but also a spirit, a ruh. But once the, the, the ruh is blown into it, now it's a human being, complete. And so then the, the discussion arises, when is the ruh blown in? And scholars differ about this. But anyways, the point I'm making is that the ruh has a d direct connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah tells us, you're never truly going to understand the ruh. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Isra, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْرُوحِ And they ask you about the spirit, O Muhammad, قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي Say that the spirit, the ruh, this is from the affairs of my Lord. Allah knows about it. We don't truly understand the nature of it. But life comes to an end when the ruh is extracted, not merely when the heart stops beating. And there's a, there's a difference there. Angels. Angels are angelic in nature. Angels don't have a nafs. We're going to talk about the nafs down here shortly. Angels don't have that, which is why angels completely obey Allah. They, do, they never disobey. They, they never disobey what Allah commands them to do. And they do what they're commanded. And that's why when we see human beings who are just so, so righteous, we, we almost describe them as being angelic, right? This person has an angelic nature. Meaning what? They don't have the obvious or apparent um, signs of someone dominated by their nafs. 
They're just like, they're just so, they're so pious. They're so pure. That's another word we use for people who are angelic. They're just pure, pure natured people. Because that's what angels are. Pure in their nature. They have no inner kind of battle going on. Human beings do. Because of the nef- nefs. Humans have this battle that constantly goes on. Right? Well, we're going to talk about that. So, the ruh, and that's why the ruh is nourished not by things of the world. You do not nourish your ruh through food, through any means of the world uh, in terms of buying something or eating something. No. The ruh is nourished through connection with the divine. And every day as human beings, we have this war. Do we give victory to our ruh or do we give victory to our nafs? Our nafs, on the other hand, as you see it, faces towards the dunya. Our nafs is the means by which we engage with the dunya. And it is through the ruh that we engage with the unseen world. This is how we get angels that come and whisper in our hearts. It's from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. That you have devils that whisper into your heart and angels. And the battlefield for the human being is their heart. Right? So, the nafs is connected to this dunya, to this world. And um, in, 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 in terms of how it connects, that's going to determine its value. Is your nafs a healthy nafs? A disciplined nafs? If so, it becomes a great means of you earning paradise as we mentioned at the beginning. If not, it becomes a means of your destruction. That's why the word nafs comes from three root letters, nun, fa, and sin in Arabic. And these three letters can come from different, I'm gonna get a little bit technical here, but different babs they're called, different verb forms. So depending on which verb form it comes from, it has a different meaning. So, you have what's called bab karuma yakrumu, nafusa yanfusu. This, in this meaning, it means to be valuable. That's where you get names like nafis or nafisa, which mean valuable, something really, really expensive or valuable. But then if you have it from bab sami'a yasma'u, nafisa yanfasu, now it means to be lowly. The nafs simultaneously has the potential to be both really, really valuable if it's disciplined, if it's brought into obedience to Allah, but it also has the means to really drag you down, really drag you down. And that's how we could also think about the world. Is the world a, a terrible place? The dunya? We often talk about the dunya with like really negative connotation, right? Dunya, dunya. And there's a hadith that says, dunya mal'unatun, the dunya is cursed. Anyone ever heard that hadith? The dunya is cursed. You think like, okay, everything's just gone to hell. It's not the case. Because Allah in the Quran also used another word for, for the universe, the alam. Alam, the cosmos, what exists. Alam is a very positive connotation. It has the root letters of ain lam mim, from like alima to know, or alam, which is like a sign. If you take the dunya, as signs pointing you to God, suddenly this dunya is no longer cursed for you. If you take, that's why the hadith goes on to say, the dunya is cursed, except, illa dhikrullah, except the remembrance of Allah, or anything connected to the remembrance of God. If you use the dunya to connect you to God, it's no longer cursed. Which version of the dunya is cursed? The dunya that is dani. The dunya that's lowly, that drags you towards itself away from God. And for many of us in the, in, in the world that we live in today, that's the world we're occupying. A world that drags us away from God on a daily basis. And so that's why it's very common for us to refer to the dunya in a very negative way. But really it comes down to our nafs. How do we engage? Think of the nafs as almost like the window through which you go and engage with the world. How are you going and engaging with the world? See, think about young children. Young children are like pure nafs. They're like pure nafs. What do young children do? They just want things. 
They want to have fun. They want to eat good food. They want to sleep sometimes, right? Um, they just, they want to do what they feel like doing. And then the parent has to come along and spoil all the fun by putting boundaries. Now, as an adult, what's the difference? How many of y'all have heard of the marshmallow test? Right? What are you testing there in the marshmallow test? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Whether or not the child can delay gratification. It can be very challenging. An adult should be able to pass that test, no problem. An adult should be able to pass that test, no problem. But for a young child who's like four or three, it can be very challenging because it's right in front of them. Their nafs desperately wants it. What you know, separates an adult? The adult's meant to have cognitive development. The aql. The word aql in Arabic literally comes from the roots which means to restrain. That's where you have iqal which is what you use to restrain a horse, like the halter, to like restrain a horse. That's what the aql is meant to be. It's meant to be the restraining force holding back the nafs from that which is harmful for it. You as a parent serve as the aql in the life of the child because the child sometimes has no idea what's good for them. The child can be offered a check of $1,000 or or what? Or like one, I don't know, Nintendo Switch game. And this child's gonna take the Nintendo Switch game. Going like, that, why would I not take the game? And you have to be like, no, don't take that, take the check. Because they don't understand the check. They don't understand the value of the check. They don't know how many hundreds of games maybe, or maybe tens of games probably in this economy, right? Of Nintendo Switch games they could buy with that check. And so the parent comes along and says, this is harmful, this is helpful. Serving as the... So if you want to see a nafs, just look at children, young, young children. Can you reason with them? Sometimes we make that mistake, right? We sit them, they're like two years old and we're trying to explain to them like the benefits of waiting. They don't get it. They just look at that toy and say, I want that toy. Now you can hold them back. So they might just, you know, you can dist a lot of us distract them, right? What about that? Hey, look over here. We do it all the time, right? Because we, we realize you can't, like, explain. You know, it's actually very beneficial for you to delay your gratification. You know, when you're in 25, it'll we don't do that. The little kid will look at you like, I, that's nice to know. I want that toy. We don't reason. We just hold them back. See, as we get older, though, the nafs will continue to desire. And if we don't get in the habit of restraining the nafs, of giving power to our intellect over our nafs, weakening our nafs, developing unhealthy habits for our nafs, then we will also throw temper tantrums with our nafs. They will be a little bit more sophisticated than young children. Yeah. So we'll do it in different ways, which are not so obvious which hopefully don't have us on the floor stamping our arms and legs, right? We'll do it though. We'll be really upset. We will be angry at God. We will be, you know, really, really upset with not getting what we wanted our way. But that's very much like a child. You know, we will feel like we can never be happy. You know what's, do you know where you see a person really struggling between still giving in to their nafs and actually trying to be a grown-up is like a teenager. You ever seen teenagers? They're like stuck in like a really awkward spot. I really feel bad for teenagers, man. How many of you would agree with me that it's one of the hardest times in life? I, I understand like university's tough as well and like all, you know, but, but your resources tend to be more at that time. You know, a lot of us will have jobs at that time, so we have some money. You're like in high school, your body's changing, your school's changing, like everything's changing. You don't even have the intellectual resources always to like make sense of what's happening. It's tough. And so you see them really torn between sometimes acting very mature. You ever had that? Where like one day they're like really mature. You're like, oh, you're growing up. And the next day you're like, no, you're not, right? Like the next day is another tantrum. You're like, Whoa, what happened? Because that's what happens. Is the nafs when it's not restrained with the aql. 
it can get really out of hand. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this. Imam al-Ghazali, he says, every single sin that a human being has ever done can always be traced back to the nafs. Sure, shaitan might have come and incited the human being to that sin, but the ultimate desire for the sin came from the nafs of the individual. Think about it. Imam al-Ghazali begins to go through, you know, um, the stories of the prophets. How, why did the son of Adam, Qabil, why did he kill his brother? Jealousy, back to the nafs. Name a sin. Guys, let's do this. Name a sin. Backbiting. Okay, what's, what's the, how do you trace that back to the nafs? Why do we backbite? Because it feels good. It feels good to assert your superiority over someone by sh- talking about how terrible of a person they are. So you feel good, isn't it? Isn't that why, isn't, isn't that why it's hard sometimes to not backbite? Like, you, I really want to tell you something, but I can't. Astaghfirullah. And like, we're just like, I mean, that's a sign. The nafs is itching to like, just talk. And we're pulling it back. Right? So then we're like, okay, I won't say the name. Right? Then we do that one. I won't say the name. But right, enough clues. And the other person's sitting there like Sherlock Holmes going like, hmm. Okay, so they're not in there. What are we doing, guys? It's really interesting. What's another sin? Lying. How does lying go back to your... Your nafs. Why do we lie? Sorry? Deflection. So what are we trying to do in the process? Preserve? Preserve our image, our identity, how people think about us. So we lie so that people don't find out. So we're trying to benefit ourselves. We're trying for us to, our own self-identity to be upheld even though we're ready to sacrifice the truth. And you could do this with every sin. The obvious ones are very obvious going back to the, to the nefs and desires. But even, you know, some scholars go like to the point of if you trace it back to wars between people, at, it's asserting your superiority over someone else. Believing that you're superior. And that goes back to your nefs, arrogance of the nefs. The desire for power over others. Everything will go back to the nafs. And so this is not a small matter. Imam al-Ghazali goes on to say, he says, you know why the nafs is so challenging? Because it's the enemy within. It's the enemy within. And that's why we sometimes will be aware of shaitan. We'll be like, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim right? But we're not aware that there's a traitor within us. It's the nafs that shaitan partners with to get to our heart. Do you understand? So we lock all the doors, but you still got the nefs inside. Do you understand that? And that's where the human being can be like, you know what? I'm not going to go to any place where there's haram happening. I'll be at home alone. You ever heard the saying, the idle man's brain is the devil's workshop? It's just... Because he just comes and he starts whispering to the nafs. And I just want to throw out an idea here, guys. A lot of us need to reflect on our relationship with boredom. The moment we start to feel a little bored, a lot of us might realize that we have some really bad habits. We start to feel bored, we pull out our phone. Immediately. You start doing work, pull out your phone. It's our, our discomfort with negative emotions. Do you understand? Um, we're bored. So that's when shaitan begum, be, begins to whisper to the nafs. Well, hey, wouldn't it be more fun and exciting if you just did X, Y, Z? We need to think about this. Um, I think we're, a, we're, we're very addicted um, to many different things. And we don't know how to be bored and uh, alone anymore without external stimulation. And we don't realize that Ultimately, what's being stimulated is the nafs. So, shaitan uses the nafs as an inside man against us. Now, imagine you started to 
to approach life with that perspective, where now the nafs is not an afterthought, where it's, it's part and parcel of every interaction. Maybe then it'll make sense when we are taught in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that never are a man and woman alone, except unmarried and unrelated, except that shaitan is the third. Khalwa, to be in solitude. Maybe that will make sense. Why? Because some of us might say, Shaykh, listen, look, we're civilized people, right? We're, we can just be professional about it. So why is this hadith like just assuming that we're going to do terrible things? Why can't you just trust that we will be good people? No, you're probably a good person. Your nafs? I don't know. No, seriously. You? Mashallah. Your nafs? I don't know about that. You might know what the right thing to do is. But can you trust your nafs? Do you understand that? That's where these rulings come in. These rulings come in not because you're uncivilized and all, you know, that's not the point. The point is your nafs. It is really, really slippery and easily deceived. It's when we let our guards down that the devil has its be his best chance at attacking us. So, what do you do then? The question becomes, what do you do to begin to protect your heart and ensure that your nafs is disciplined and under control? This is where we want to start talking about the pathways to one's heart. See, the nafs, the nafs, what is supplied to the nafs then impacts the heart, your state of your heart overall. The state of your heart overall is impacted both by the state of your ruh and the state of your nafs. And we could go into a lot more detail about the nafs here. Because um, the, the, the nafs itself has faculties. And then I'll, I'll hold that off for a different discussion someday. But the, the, the nafs is connected, it has a faculty of anger, quwatul ghadab. It has a faculty of appetite, quwatul shahwa. It also has a faculty of justice, which is when everything's in equilibrium. And for some of us, when the nafs becomes too aggressive, that's the, that's the, the, the nafs that's unhealthy. Or sometimes we become very driven by appetites. And I think in our society today, we are a very appetite-driven society. How are things sold to us? Think about that. You know who understands the nafs? Marketers. How do they sell things to us? They'll sell it through appetites. Right? They sell it through appetites. How do fast food people sell food? Showing you the crispiness. Showing you dipping something into something. Right? The smooth texture, like I'm not trying to make anybody hungry, but like, that's what they do. They don't tell you like, this is super healthy for you. Unless they're trying to sell something healthy, but right? If they're trying to sell you something else, they'll put a certain person on it that will be appealing to your nafs. This is what they do. This is how things are sold to us. It's appealing to our nafs. Look, show of hands, guys. Honesty hour. How many of us here have a steps counter where we track how many steps we're taking. Nice, nice. Okay. How many people, let's, okay, let's not put our hands up because maybe some people are uncomfortable, but how many of us track our calories down to like the calorie, All right? Some of us will do it. Here's my question now, tough one. How many of us have any idea of how many inappropriate pictures we saw today? Not even intentionally. Like, not even intentionally. Like, you just open the Explore page and boom, the, alg the, the algorithm just, here you go. You didn't ask for it, but here it is. Can we keep track of it? How many? How many times driving down the street did we look at something or haram? Like, do we even have a number? It start, it's scary to start thinking about that. Well, what's the number? Are we talking in the tens, the hundreds? In one day. 
Why am I talking about that? Because all of these things are fueling the nafs. And remember, these things are triggers. That's another thing to think about. When we end up sinning, there's usually triggers. Things that enter through the pathways come to the heart. The heart is now, you know, bursting with desire and the individual is pushed to move. Pushed to move through which energy? The energy of their nafs, not the energy of the soul, the ruh, not something pure. Think about Ramadan. Ramadan is a classic example when, for many of us, the ruh is victorious in comparison to our nafs. The nafs is weakened. You're not even feeding it from morning till evening. For a lot of us, we start to like cut out so many haram sources during Ramadan. And we don't have food, we don't have relations, we have nothing. So the nafs is really weakened. You do that for 30 days over and over again, properly. The ruh, and suddenly, what does Allah do on top of that? Don't just pray your normal prayers. Pray like at least 8 to 10 to 20 raka'at at night time. Read more Quran. Fast. And now you're just like fueling the ruh. Is it any surprise then that during the month of Ramadan, we feel so close to God? Worship feels so easy. We almost don't even have the same desire for the sins that we have outside of Ramadan. Because the nafs is so weakened. Do you, do you get that? And the ruh is, it's not just the nafs is weakened, but also the ruh is strengthened. The ruh is strengthened. So what does shaitan do? Shaitan uses different pathways to get to the nafs in the heart and to ruin the person's heart. The pathways are our eyes, our ears, our tongue, our limbs, our stomach. These are all ways shaitan uses to get to the human being's heart. Does that make sense? So there's things that are desirable to look at, desirable to listen to, desirable to speak about, but are completely haram. But they're desirous, they're made desirable by shaitan. Things that are haram to eat, but we desire them. And so these are all ways. Imam al-Ghazali, he, com he compares, he says, you know, just like the food that enters your body um, impacts the health of your body, whatever is entering through the pathways is impacting the health of your spiritual heart. So a lot of us talk about being on a diet. So I want to eat certain foods and stay away from others for my health. What about a spiritual diet? If we were to all just do like a moment, you know, very general assessment right now in our heads, what's my spiritual diet looking like? Do you know what I'm saying? That's a tough one. And that's where now you start to be, live life a little bit more intentionally. Wait, it's not harmless just for me to pull out my phone anymore. It's not harmless just for me to say what I, whatever I want to say. Everything has a repercussion. It's like, you just can't mindlessly eat whatever you want. It's going to impact your health. And you do it long enough and it'll catch up to you. Spiritually, you do it long enough and then you're going to wonder, I don't know why I just don't feel like even praying. What's your, when someone comes and says, like, I don't feel like doing anything, I just feel really tired. One of the first questions we ask is like, how's your sleep? What's your diet looking like? Do you drink water? Are you getting any exercise on a daily basis? Do you have any goals? We start asking all these basic questions. Spiritually, what's your diet looking like? What's your diet looking like? Really? What's our diet looking like? We all have, a, I think, a real need to sit down and, and kind of do an evaluation on a daily basis. From the moment I wake up to the moment I sleep, can I even keep track? Some estimate of how many things haram that I listen to, that I see, that I say, that I look at, like how many? That I eat maybe? And then that will give us some idea of why our heart is in the state that it's in. The eyes, one of the pious, they said, if someone doesn't control their eye, it's like, it's like their heart has no value for them. It's like their heart has no value for them. 
When do you start to take care of your health? When you value your body. You say, you know what? I'm important. Like, I, I have value, and as does my body. Since it's something valuable, I'm going to start taking care of it. You know, like the first year or the first few months you get a car? You know how everyone takes care of their car in the first month or two months you get it? You like every single day you're like checking, you're keeping it clean, all right? People are really just because it's valuable. Once you lose that appreciation for it, you start to not mind, you know, a little mess here and there and then take your time getting it detailed, right? What about the, uh, our bodies? Same thing. When we value our bodies and we start to say, no, like I really need to be in shape. I, I have a reason. Um, I, have a, I have a why for why I need to be healthy. You know, you can, get, you can get healthy or like take care of your body for reasons driven by the nefs right? And that's to impress someone that maybe you're not supposed to be trying to impress because they're not halal for you. But that, there's a strong drive. You ever seen someone come out of heartbreak? You ever seen someone like that? And the way that they have a drive, you're like, where's this energy coming from? No, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, I currently know someone like that. Dude runs like 20 kilometers every day. Posts his Strava. Yeah. Like somebody really broke his heart. I'm not even exaggerating. This morning, this morning, two hours, 20 kilometers, just random. And then he'll go do leg day and then, you know. Where does that energy come from? Where does that motivation come from? Nafs. Nafs. No, I'm serious. Some of us, we, we haven't learned what's a healthy way to fuel my nafs. I remember talking to somebody and I was like, why don't you worry about your health? He's like, bro, I'm already married. I said, subhanAllah, like, astaghfirullah. That's what he said to me. He said, I'm already married. I said, that's why you got to be in shape. And he was like, so confused. Like, I got her. I'm like, that's not, see, you totally missed the point here. So some of us haven't realized that there are healthy reasons for us, for example, to take care of our bodies. What about the ability to stand in prayer? for longer. What about, anyone ever like start, <laughs> start walking more before they go for Umrah or something? You know what I'm talking about? The pre-Umrah suddenly walking around the neighborhood, right? Because you, that's a pious now, mashallah, reason for trying to get in shape. No, I'm serious. We need to start developing more healthy intentions behind the good that we do. Even our ears. What are the words that we listen to? <clears throat> what are the words that we read? Oh, this is so important. What's the, what's, the, what's the content that you read? And how does that impact your heart? Are you reading good, healthy content? Enriching content? Or are you reading Skibbity Riz, Ohio? Like, what are you reading? No, I'm serious. Quality literature. It does wonders for your soul very demure, very mindful. No, like read meaningful things. I cannot emphasize this enough. The value of what you consume in your reading. That's why reading the Quran is profound because you're not just reading good literature, you're reading divine scripture. And so we need to be a little bit more intentional about what we're consuming. So I want to finish here with what does one do practically to start to begin to deal with their nafs. Well, one of the first things we have to do is we have to weaken it so that we can enable our ruh, a chance. See, for most of us, our nafs is this nafs right here called an-nafsul ammaratu bisu. This is the nafs that is so accustomed to um, getting what it wants that it's constantly prompting you. And no sooner do you control it that it stops asking. Have you ever seen that with children too? If you can get them to like not expect something, they stop asking. I'll give you an example, because you might be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me give you an example. How many of y'all have at some point, that point might be now, but let's just talk about it in the past tense. At some point, desired something sweet after eating every single time, right? At some point, guys, we're not saying now, could be. What happens when you stop doing it? 
initially there's this withdrawal where like you, you want it, you're looking for it, right? And you're like beating yourself up like, why did I buy everything healthy at the grocery store, right? Should have bought something unhealthy for these moments. But then what happens if you, keep, if you stick with it? You no longer desire it. And so our nafs, so long as we, pr- that's what Imam al-Busiri, he says, we sometimes do this. He says, فَلَا تَرُمْ بِالْمَعَاصِي كَسْرَ شَهْوَتِهَا Don't think that if I will give it what it wants, it'll stop asking. You only make it stronger. How many of us have done that? This is my last cheat meal. That's it. I'm just going to give my body that last cheat meal. I'll feel good and I'll be motivated to be healthy. No. It's not how that, you know, it's not how that played out. One last sin, and I'll just leave this after that. No. Inna ta'ama yuqawi shahwatan nahimi, he says. He says, when you feed something, it only makes it stronger. It's deprivation. It's saying no. Using your aql to restrain the nafs and say no. I sound like I'm talking about drugs here, eh? Say no. No, but like, some of these things for us, that's what it is. It's really harming us. We have to start weaning ourselves off of some of these really, really uh, desirable things to our nafs. And sometimes you actually have to go to a little bit of an extreme just to kind of bring about balance. Do you know what I'm saying? You ever seen somebody like fully cut out sugar to then slowly introduce it back in a healthier way, you know? But you go to that initial extreme to balance it out. For some of us, we need to like maybe, I don't know, really just delete some apps and then intentionally re-engage with those apps. Do you get what I'm saying here? So deprivation of the appetites for the nafs. When we say appetites, I don't just mean food. What are all the haram sources that we're fueling our nafs with? Start cutting those things out. Then on top of that, now that the nafs starts to become weak when you're not giving it what it wants and fueling it, now you strengthen the ruh by increasing in your good deeds. I mean, that's why we have Monday, Thursday fasting. That's why we have Fajr. Fajr is really powerful for your nafs and really, it really does a, takes a toll on your nafs. But it's powerful for your ruh. And so now, when you weaken the nafs and you strengthen the the ruh through worship, now you're getting into a more healthy place. The last thing we'll mention here is ultimately, ultimately, all success comes from God. You will not overcome your nafs except with Allah's help. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِ إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِسُوء The nafs commands and incites to evil إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي Except those upon whom Allah has mercy. If we want to overcome our nafs, we will not be able to do it alone. We must always ask for Allah's help in overcoming our nafs, for His mercy, in not being slaves to our nafs, but being the masters of our nafs. May Allah Ta'ala grant us tawfiq. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullahu khairan.